Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. Today, I want to talk about projective space from the point of view of invariant theory. So in this example, this will illustrate both the problem of non-closed orbits that we saw before, but also hints at Mumford's method for constructing group quotients in the quasi-projective case. Okay, so let's see what our setup is. So as usual, we'll start with some sort of a field K. And then the group that we're going to look at, G, is the multiplicative group of non-zero scalars inside K. So of course, you can multiply elements inside here. That's the group multiplication. And this will let act on if you're considering n-dimensional predictive space, n plus one-dimensional affine space. And suppose the variables are x0 up to xn. Okay, so remember how does this group act on this uh, affine space here? It acts by scaling. So if you have zeta, is some non-zero scalar. Okay, you can scale all the coordinates by the same amount to give you a new element of this affine space here. Okay, so in algebraic geometry, of course, you study this affine space through its coordinate ring, which in this case is just a polynomial ring in the variables x0 up to xn. And since this group acts on here it also acts on this polynomial ring as well okay so let's have a look at that as uh, just to remind you for example if you have a polynomial like this x1 q plus x2 x3 okay we'll scale x1 to zeta x1 so the cube will go to zeta cubed x1 cubed and we'll scale each of x2 and x3 to zeta x2 and zeta x3 so in total this term becomes zeta squared x2 x3 okay so what we can do is we can look at what is the group quotient uh, here, a to the n plus 1, uh, quotient out by g. Okay, So you can look at the scheme quotient there. And the way to do that, remember, is that you look in terms of the coordinate ring. You can say, what is the coordinate ring of this quotient here? So what you do is you look at the coordinate ring of this a to the n plus 1. So that's this polynomial ring in variables x0 to xn. And you just look at the invariance here. Okay, So this taking this subring of invariance corresponds to looking at the quotient by this group action. Okay, So let's have a look at that. Well, how does the group act? So we saw basically what it does. Okay, It acts on each of the monomials. And what it does, it will scale all the monomials by zeta to the appropriate power, the degree of that monomial. So this one is cubed, so it gets scaled by zeta cubed. This is a square term, or degree 2 term, so it is scaled by zeta squared. Okay? So if you want this polynomial to remain invariant, of course, that means that all the monomials that occur here, they must have degree 0, so they get scaled by zeta to the 0. In other words, they're the constants. Okay? So the only invariants here you get are just k. And once we have the coordinate ring for this, we can say what is the actual affine variety or affine scheme corresponding to that. Of course, this is just the coordinate ring of a single point. Okay, a single point is a to the zero, so it's the polynomial ring in zero variables. Okay, so that's just a single point. Okay, functions on the point is exactly k. Okay, so in this case here, this quotient is not particularly interesting. Okay, it's just a single point. That's what we find. And why? What is happening in this case? Well, let's have a look at the orbits, okay? So let's uh, look in the special case n equals 1. So you have the affine plane A2, okay? And we pick some sort of point like this, x maybe. And let's look at its orbit. So its orbit, you apply all the group elements. So you look at all uh, non-zero scalar multiples of this. And of course, you get this, uh, essentially this line which goes through this x, excluding the zero here. So that's the orbit g dot x. And what you notice about this orbit, okay, at least if x is not this, uh, is a non-zero point, so it doesn't equal this one here, is that it's not closed, okay. In fact, it has the zero in the closure, okay. So the orbits, what are the or orbits? You have lots of orbits which look like this, and there will be one extra orbit, the orbit of the um, point zero, and of course the orbit of zero is just you have zero here. Um, this is always equal to zero, so that's just that point there. Okay, so the point is there's actually only one closed orbit, the orbit of zero. And all the other orbits are open, and their closure contains this one here. So when you map from this a to the n plus 1 down to the quotient, of course, all these open orbits have to get sent to where this closed orbit gets sent to, so it, gets, it completely collapses to a single point here. Okay, so in this case here, when you take this uh, scheme quotient, 
you just get a point which is not very interesting and in terms of relating it to the original uh, usual quotient where you look at the set of orbits you see you've lost a lot of information there okay so uh, some extra remarks okay of course you can look at a to the n plus 1 mod g okay the set of orbits as a topological space okay it's certainly uh, there's a set quotient from a n plus 1 to this set of orbits here so you get an induced topology okay however you want to look at that and if you look at the induced topology it's highly non-separated okay so this is something that's a bit strange about this topological space and it's one way to see why this uh, there are problems involved when you try to understand this okay so in terms of algebraic geometry it turns out that you can talk about this actual quotient but unfortunately it's not a scheme okay it doesn't come from some commutative ring okay if it did come from a commutative ring the only commutative ring that you could look at is this one here and of course that gives you uh, just a single point okay so it doesn't come from what's called a scheme but you can talk about more general algebra geometric objects and they're known as stacks in this case an algebraic stack um, and in particular an Artin stack okay so there are more general things out there and a lot more complicated and they do capture actually the g orbits okay but unfortunately it's not a scheme and uh, certainly not an affine scheme so you can't capture it just with a commutative ring like that okay so let's look at projective space and remind ourselves what happens when we study projective space. Okay, So there are several ways to define it, but one way is as follows. What you do is you look at this affine n plus 1 space, okay, and you remove the zero. You remove this problem, um, this closed orbit here. Okay, you remove that, and then you look at the set of quotients okay, uh, by this group action. So it's the same group action that I have here. Okay? And when you do that, you get projective space p to the n. Okay, so what's happening here, okay? So when we look at this, okay, so some things to uh, remark. So firstly, the only thing that we changed in going from this setup here, a n plus 1, and we question out by g, and this one here is we remove the point 0. So we looked at an open subset of the original affine space, okay, by removing this point 0. So when you take an open set and you form the quotient, okay in this sense you'll get something that's very big okay but if you look at the whole thing at least if you form this quotient you get something that's very small okay so uh, if one way to describe it is that the formation of this quotient is actually incompatible with open sets okay you take an open set here and you'd expect you don't only get some open set of this instead what do you find you'll find a whole pn okay so let's see uh, how it plays in terms of the orbits, okay? So when you remove this point here, what do you notice about this orbit g dot x here? Well, this g, g orbit now is closed inside a2 minus this point, okay? Because the closure was of it was what? It's where you add this point in. Actually, the closure inside the affine plane is where you add this point in. So if you remove that point, then it's closed, right? And so since they're closed orbits, and in this theory here, you can distinguish uh, closed orbits, you see, that's why you ought to get something that's more interesting here. Okay, so whereas all these open orbits were identified with a single point now, uh, in this previous example, they're now closed, so you can look at them as different points. Okay, so this raises the following question. So you've got something that should be interesting here, okay, but how do you set this theory up properly? Okay, so what's going on here? So I've told you how to form this sort of scheme quotient when you have an affine scheme here, okay, or affine variety. And that is, you look on the level of coordinate rings, okay, and you do it in terms of invariant rings, hence invariant theory. Okay, now here, when you remove zero from a to the n plus one, that turns out not to be an affine variety, okay? It's not affine, it's not even affine scheme. So the question naturally arises, well, of course, we want the quotient when we do this to be Pn. How do we actually get Pn using invariant theory? Well, let me show you how. So our solution is as follows. So even though this a to the n plus 1 minus 0 is not affine, you can certainly cover it with affine varieties. Okay, so we'll consider the following affine patches. Okay, so we'll look at the section where the ith coordinate is non-zero. Xi doesn't equal zero. And that's going to be affine because, why is that? Um, 
in this case, uh, if you look at the set of n plus 1 tuples where the ith one is non-zero, the coordinate ring is the same as the usual coordinate ring, kx0 up to xn, the polynomial ring in n plus 1 variables, but you have to invert xi because xi can be non-zero, so the inverse of xi is also a nice rational function well defined on the whole of this affine patch. Okay, so this uh, affine variety corresponding to this ring here is just this ui here. Okay, so now we can try to work locally on all of these patches. And one thing that you'll notice is that the group actually also acts on this patch as well. If you scale an n plus 1 tuple where the ith coordinate is non-zero, uh, the ith coordinate stays non-zero, so you'll stay inside this. So it's actually a g-stable subset. Okay. So what we're going to do is that we're going to work on each of them individually, and then we're going to piece them back together again. So we have to remember how to glue these affine patches together. Okay, so let's now assume n equals 1 to make things a little bit simpler. So we're inside the affine plane. We've got two patches where x0 is non-zero, so you're away from here, so that's given by u0. And where x1 is non-zero, so you're away from here, so that's the u1 here. Okay, and what you need to do is to glue these two together, and the data that you need to do is this diagram here. Okay, you need to know how the intersection embeds into u0 and in u1. Okay, so what do I mean by this is the gluing data? Well, how do you reconstruct this uh, a, in this case, 2 minus 0 from this data here? Okay, so what you do is you have this u0, which is going to be this bit here, okay, and this u1, that bit there, and you think of them as being disjoint, okay? And now what you do is you want to recover this a2, so you need to identify the points which came from the same place, okay? So you need to glue these two open sets together to get you the original A2 minus 0. And how do you glue them together? Okay, so which points of U0 get uh, glued to which points of U1? Well, the only the points which come from the image of this get glued to something here. So it comes from here, okay? The point that, that that one gets glued to is you go back up here, and then you look at the corresponding image down in U1, and you glue it to that, okay? So that's how the gluing data works in that case. Okay, well that's great. To study this diagram, if you want to do it completely algebraically, you can work on the coordinate rings. So let's look at the coordinate rings. So we've seen the coordinate rings of these affine patches. Okay, U0 you get from the polynomial ring in two variables, X0, X1, by also throwing in the inverse of X0, and here you throw in the inverse of X1 as well. Okay, and now what happens is if you need to uh, remove both uh, and assume x0 is non-zero and x1 is non-zero, then you need both x0 inverse and x1 inverse. So the coordinate ring of this intersection is just uh, the algebra generated by x0 and x0 inverse, x1 and x1 inverse. Okay, so that's what you have. So you have two uh, localization maps like this. And this diagram algebraically on the ring theoretic level captures what's happening in this here. Okay, so now that we're in this situation, we have all these affine varieties, okay, we can now apply the theory that we had before, okay, the geometric invariant theory, which says that if you want to take quotients and you work on the dual algebraic side, you look at invariance. So let's just take invariance of everything inside here. Okay, so let's start with this object here. So remember how the group acts on these variables. Basically, it scales them, okay. So it turns out the only invariants are the things of degree zero. Now, when we looked in the rigid polynomial ring, of course, the only invariants that you get are the constants. They're the only things of degree zero. But now you've got an x0 inverse here. So now it turns out that if you consider some uh, rational function like x1 divided by x0, that's degree zero. Of course, when you try to scale x1 by zeta, x0 gets scaled by zeta as well. So this is actually invariant, okay? So it turns out that, of course, also any polynomial in x1 over x0 is also invariant. And in fact, you can show that the set of invariants inside here is precisely this polynomial ring here. Okay, so we can do a similar thing with the other side. Now the x1 is the only thing allowed to be in the denominator, so instead you have polynomials in x0 over x1. Okay, so now let's look at the invariants inside here. Okay, inside here. And it's quite easy to show that in this case, what you have as the invariants, of course, you've got x0 over x0. And from here, you've also got x0 and x1. 
And if you look at the algebra generated by those two, then you'll get the whole invariant ring of this here. Okay? So just note that these two are not unrelated to each other, they're just inverses of each other. So in fact, it's quite easy to say what this is. Okay? So now we've taken, we've worked on the dual algebraic side, and we taken invariance which corresponds to the group quotients, we just need to go over to the geometric side by looking at the corresponding affine varieties. So let's do that. Okay, so what do we have over here? You just have a polynomial ring in one variable. So the corresponding affine variety is just the affine line in that one variable x1 over x0. Okay, similarly here you have the affine line in the corresponding variable which now is x0 over x1. Okay, so what's going on up here? So here you don't have simply a polynomial ring, okay, because you've not only thrown in one generator, you've got two, but the other one is the inverse of this one here. So basically, you can think of this as, well, you get it from here, but you look at this affine line, but you throw in the inverse of this variable, so you have to uh, remove the zero of this, which is a zero, okay? So it's a1 minus zero, so that maps into here. And it also maps to here, but the zero goes to, so to speak, the infinity uh, uh, part of the projective line. Okay, so this maps into here, and it maps into here, and it gives you a way to glue these two copies of A1 together. Okay, so now we can actually take the quotient. Okay, so remember, this is the gluing data to get you your A2 minus zero. Okay, A2 minus zero. Now we took group questions of each of these three objects and we get these three objects here. And that is the gluing data which allows us to glue these two together. Okay, so this quotient now, which I will define as P1, okay, it's going to be these two, you think of them as being disjoint first and then you glue them together according to this diagram. And that's in fact the way you usually construct P1 and of course if you have a more complicated gluing, which takes into account more of these patches, which occurs when n is greater than 1, you can do the same thing for Pn. And in that way, you get a nice way of looking at the construction of P1, which shows exactly how it matches with the invariant theory. Okay, so it turns out that Mumford had a beautiful generalization of what goes on here. Okay, uh, so I don't have enough time to describe all the details that goes into it, but it's nice to know how his theory roughly works, okay, and what the setting is. So first you have some reductive group G, which acts on some uh, quasi-projective variety X, and then extra piece of data that you need to throw into it is what's called a G equivariant line bundle, okay, I won't go into the details there, but the point is that when you're in that situation here, what you can do is you can find a nice open subset of that called XSS. In fact, there are two, but let's just concentrate on this one here. SS, he stands for semi-stable points. So uh, the situation that corresponds here is if you pick a certain equivariant line bundle in this setting where the group acts on A to N plus 1, then the open set will be this open set here where you remove the zero. Okay, that's an example of a set, uh, such an open set of semi-stable points. And then you're in this sort of a setup, precisely, okay? So what does that mean? So firstly, this open set you can describe as a union of G-stable uh, subsets. And in fact, those G-stable subsets are all also affine in the sense that they're the spec of some commutative ring R alpha. So that's what we saw here, okay? So these affine sets, okay, which um, you cover, they're the uh, spec of these rings here, okay? And once you're in that situation, since these are G-stable, well, you can look at the invariance of these rings to get you the quotients of these affine patches by G, okay, these scheme quotients here. Okay, and once you do that, you can do the same thing here. You can construct all the gluing data to glue all these together to get you this quotient XSS double mod G. Okay, so this is extremely interesting and it has lots and lots of applications in mathematics. Um, but one thing that is rather intriguing is it does depend on this choice of the G equivariant line bundle. And this choice here leads to extremely interesting mathematics, in fact. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.